und beschäftigen uns auf dem nächsten Panel mit einer, der, einer zentralen Frage, die auch schon immer wieder im Laufe des Tages aufgekommen ist. Das ist die Frage des Wasserzugangs und des Klimawandels in der Region. Ich will da jetzt gar nicht weiter darauf eingehen, das machen unsere Panelistinnen. Leider sind alle drei online zugeschaltet, das hätten wir uns anders gewünscht. Der eine ist der Medikopartner Egid Ibrahim, der, habe ich ja schon eingangs gesagt, einfach keinen gültigen Pass bekommen hat. Der wäre wirklich sehr gerne hier gewesen, das hätten wir uns auch gewünscht. Ähm, Nick Hiltjad aus London, das war klar, dass der online dazukommt und Katrin Henneberger, Abgeordnete von den Grünen, musste leider kurzfristig einen Termin in Hamburg wahrnehmen und ähm, genau, nimmt deswegen auch online teil. Moderiert wird das Panel von Erdan Alboga, stellvertretender ähm, Leiter der Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung Hessen, bei dem ich mich ganz herzlich bedanken möchte. Erdan hat uns im Vorfeld der Konferenz unterstützt. Wir haben Sachen gemeinsam geplant und auch die Rosa-Luxemburg-Stiftung ähm, genau, unterstützt diese Konferenz. Also vielen Dank auch an der Stelle nochmal und ich freue mich auf ein spannendes Panel, spannendes Panel von dir. Ja. Guten Abend, Herr Walbasch. Ähm, wir werden auf Englisch sprechen, also die drei Referentinnen und ich, ähm, Amber Ingesibach. Uh, so I change to the language. The subject of this panel is right to water, climate change and water as a weapon. Um, as Anita said, we have three speakers today. She represented, uh, introduced her very shortly. Um, We will discuss the right to water and how it is in danger, uh, threatened through climate change, but in particular by the cut of water by Turkey uh, to North and East Syria. Um, how it is the rights of how the rights of the people in North and East Syria are violated by Turkish state policy. We all experience climate change here in Germany, but the people for year, for maybe four or five years, but the people of Syria, Kurdistan, Mesopotamia, all of Western Asia experience it for more than 20 years in a dramatic way. Um, yes, um, Syria is very uh, affected by this uh, drought, this uh, continuous excessively uh, drought in, the, uh, in many regions of the world. Um, in the last years, um, we last five years maybe, um, in an accelerated way, we get information reports from journalists and especially from people of North and Syria, how the Turkish state cuts the flow of the Euphrates River to Syria and also from other water resources. Um, the water, the rivers in North Syria and East Syria especially, they come from the north, from Turkish state territory, as, which is actually North Kurdistan, the two big rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, originate there and they flow downstream to the south, to Syria and continue to Iraq. And these two rivers create, as we know, Mesopotamia. Um, yes, um, Syria is a semi-arid region. These rivers uh, are very important for the life there. Uh, the rain is, the most regions, not enough. Life without these rivers and the groundwater is not possible. Um, I was and am active in campaigns in North Kurdistan or in relation to North Kurdistan uh, against the construction of dams uh, for healthy rivers and against the privatization of water. We struggled and struggled for many years. Um, one motivation to struggle in North Kurdistan is also that the water is not cut to the people uh, down in the south, the people of Syria and Iraq. It's a responsibility for us to say this water belongs to all people along these two big rivers. Yes, um, um, first we'll speak Egid Ibrahim. 
is situated in Kamishlo, then follows Nick Hiltyard from the UK. Egit will speak a bit longer than Nick and also Katrin Henneberger uh, because she, he will also report and has to say a lot of things about the situation there concerning water. Egit leads the human rights organization Rights Defense uh, Initiative, which cooperates with Medico for some years. The staff of RDI documents human rights violations. For this purpose, they do interviews, go to the affected area um, with the victims, affected people. They now work with IIM, the UN mechanism to support the prosecution of international law crimes in Syria. Ibrahim spoke at the UN Human Rights Council in March this year. He will report directly from Kamishlo about the situation in his country. So we give the floor to Egit. Uh, Egit, you have the word, Keremke. Thank you. Thank you, Arjan, and uh, good night, uh, everyone. Good night uh, for all the participants. First of all, uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, I am Agid Ibrahim. I'm joining this discussion from North Eastern Syria, Rojava. I am the executive director of the Right Defense Initiative organization called RDI. We are a group of uh, humanitarian activists working in the field of defending human rights and victims of war violations in Syria. Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to thank Medico International for this opportunity to shed light on important issue affecting life of millions of Syrians and Iraqis, which is the issue of the violation uh, of the right to water. I will start my uh, presentation uh, with a brief report on this issue that includes several points, namely, the first point, the water was deliberately cut off by the Turkish state and the Syrian armed group under the name Syrian National Army. The goal of this violation to use it as a weapon of war by cutting off the Euphrates River water from the Syrians, as well as cutting off the water coming from uh, a log pump station in the city of Sarekania, which, which Turkey occupied in 2019 when it launched a military operation under the name Supreme of Peace. It occupied large areas of Syrian territory with a widest of 30 kilometers and a limit of 120 kilometers. Through these uh, measures, Turkey, Turkey targets the area under the autonomous administration of northeastern Syria to pressure them economically and politically. There was this retaliatory measures by cutting off the water, which is the main source of livelihood for nearly 12 million people. In addition to the fact that the Euphrates River is the main source of electricity that reaches more than 5 million Syrians. During the past years, between 2014 and 2017, most of the area through which the Euphrates River passes were under the control of the Islamic State, ISIS. Cities like Raqqa, the resort. And in this year, the Turkish state didn't carry out any water cuts. But after the autonomous administration and the international coalition had liberated this area and controlled the dams on the Euphrates River, the Turkish state cut off the water with the aim to pressure on the to put the pressure on the autonomous administration by starving millions of people. 90% whom depend on ag agriculture as a main source of livelihood, including the dams that generate electric power that feed, feed more than 5 million seniors to be out of service. Here we can say that cutting off water by the Turkish state is a crime because of the widespread and deliberate case. <coughs> I will speak a little bit about the geographic and political context, so to give a uh, full view of the situation here. So we have two sources for the water that came to the northeastern Syria. One of them is the Euphrates River, run approximately uh, 680 kilometers in Syria after crossing Turkey. It enters the Syrian land near 
the city of Jerablus passes through the city of Abu Kamal, they enter the Iraqi territory. Uh, three dams were built on the Syrian portion uh, and are used by hydroelectric power plants, Rojava dams and the dam of Tata, also Al Horia dam. The three dams usually provide power and drinking water to around 5 million citizens. In 1987, Turkey entered into a bilateral agreement with Syria, allowing 500 cubic meters per second of Euphrates of Euphrates water to enter Syria. In 1990, Syria signed an agreement with Iraq, which stipulated that Syria must divide its share from the Euphrates water with Iraq. The Syrian share is 42% and the Iraqi share is 58%. Nevertheless, 70% Decrease in water level was recorded in the Euphrates River due to the retaining by Turkey. The Euphrates River has been in a sharp decline since January 2021. It should be noted that the minimum monthly quantity of water coming from the Euphrates River to Syria in March 2021 was estimated to be 227 cubic meters. Despite the 500 meter agreement with and continue to decline up until now. This was happening despite the fact that people needed more water in the summer season, notably for drinking consumption, irrigation for animal farming, and water from the Euphrates River was also extracted in their Azor to be transported to Hasaka along the Khabur River in northeast Syria, also affected by water shortage as mentioned above. The second sword is Al Khabur River. It starts in Turkey also and enters the Syrian territory near the city of Ras al Ain and Talha. Passes through to Tamar and Hasaki cities and joins the Euphrates River near Al Busayra in Syria. It was Stated above, since October 2019, the Syrian National Army interrupted the water flow from the Alok water pumping uh, station over 20 times, which led a million people without access to water around Tiltamar and Hasek. Now I will uh, speak a little bit about the result of these measure, measures by the Turkish state. As a result, the population of northeastern Syria entertained a humanitarian catastrophe as the quantity of water is getting more and more limited. This leads to the unavailability of most pumping stations for drinking and irrigation water at the minimum level to allow efficient formation is not reached. This also reduces the ability of the water to, so to self-purify and to dry in the Lower Euphrates stream and increases. The number of pollens and uh, their construction in the water, this leads to different types of health problems kidney, skin, and parasitic diseases, urinary tract infection, poisoning, and dehydration cases, especially among children, which also increase the risk of an outbreak of COVID. 19 only, <coughs> sorry, only in the hospital of Hasake uh, last year, dozens of children died because of water pollution. And uh, in addition, today, the health authority in the autonomous administration of northeastern Syria announced, announced the spread of cholera in the area of the resort and Rakan near the Euphrates, Euphrates River. The reason is due to the drought of the river and its transformation into swamps. And it led to the death of three people last night and dozens of infection and this alert a health disaster in the area. Also around 500,000 people from North East Syria are left without water, out of population of five million in Hasaka city. This imposes new physical and economic 
burdens on civilians in different conditions as they are forced to purchase water from tanks, which are mostly unclean and unsafe, putting their lives at risk and causing more food and water insecurities. At the national level, reports speak about over 12 million Syrians facing safe uh, consequence from the lack of rain and water in the east areas. This poses a threat as well to livestock and agricultural resources. Therefore, the 2020 and 2021 and 2022 harvest season was very poor, and this situation not only affects current crops, but it will also have an impact in the next two years, according to the FAO analysis on the Syrian Arab Republic 1980 and 2021. This is particularly warning as the population of northeastern Syria depends for 80 to 90 percent of local food production. This situation is causing massive rural exodus to the cities. Nonetheless, in the cities, the economic situation is catastrophic, leading these people to live in slums or to immigrate abroad. Moreover, the dams are not achieving technical efficiency, which leads to shutdown of electric production, of which many economic activities depend. The, the, electric, the electrical supplies between uh, January and May 2021 decreased by more than 50% in addition. Syria is not able to respect its obligation to provide Iraqi's share of uh, 290 copies per cent, which puts potential and additional 7 million people at risk of losing access to water from the region. The humanitarian, economic, and environmental crisis are those becoming worse. The last point I will shed light on is the international instrument related to this issue. I will mention some paragraphs that are related to this issue. One of them is the right to water was explicitly recognized at the international level at the United Nations Water Conference, 1977 in the following terms, all people, whatever their stage of development and their social and economic conditions, have the right to have access to drinking water in quantities and of a quality equal to their basic needs. Also, as for the UN General Assembly, the, I will continue from, what, from where I stopped. I think uh, it's uh, from uh, the situation uh, yeah, as, as for the UN General Assembly, it declared in 2010 that the right to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation as a human right that is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. As per, as per paragraph one of Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the affected community have the right to an adequate standard of living for the health and well-being, including food, which comprises access to water. The situation addressed in this report affected, affects many children, which goes against the Convention of the Rights of the Child, ratified by Syria on 15 of July 1993 and by Turkey on 4 April 1995. Article 24 indicates that states parties must ensure the enjoyment of the highest uh, attainable standard of health for children and should ensure adequate nutrition food of the child stated in its general comments number seven. A gender perspective should be considered while dealing with this case. Indeed, women are also affected by the situation and as stated in the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women assessed by Turkey in 1985 and by Syria in 2003 state, states, state parties shall, shall take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in rural areas. 
in order to ensure on a passing of equality of men and women that they participate in and be development and in particular shall ensure to such women the right to enjoy adequate living conditions. Sorry. I will just speak, maybe it's, the internet is very weak. Additionally, the International Law Commission said in the third report on the law of non-navigational users of international water courses that withholding by Diversion or other means of water from the system state, so as to place in jeopardy the survival of civilians pollution or to imperil the arability of the environment is prohibited in peacetime and in time of armed conflict. According to the ICRS see, rules on customary international law, deliberate starvation of civilian is considered a violation of laws and customs of war subject to criminal prosecutions. Uh, as a result or a recommendation that we can have from this uh, short report is in view of the above, we must argue the state of Turkey too, to respect its international legal obligation and commitment with respect to human rights, to to stop limiting water access from the river to North East Syria and to respect, promote, and fulfill the, life, the right to water of the population and to provide access to remedy for communities and individuals affected by the after mentioned violation. We should have a mechanism to push Turkey to stop this violation to right to water for the Syrian people and here is the rule of civil society. The national community and human rights organization, this mechanism will work if really we want to protect people and give them this assistance to stay in their homes and now. Uh, thank you for your patience and I hope that I could provide some useful information about this issue. Thank you, Arjan. Thank you, Egid. An uh, important speech about how the violation of water as a right of violation uh, of water is happening and he uh, focused also on the international conventions and instruments and listed his requests. Now we continue with Nick Hildyard. Hello Nick. Uh, Hi. Make a small oh, introduction. Yeah. Fine, fine. And you? I'm very well. It's great to see you. Yes, for me too. Uh, Nick works for the British NGO, The Corner House, whose principles are solidarity and mutual learning. Uh, he has been involved in, with water issues in environmental and social justice movements for over 40 years. He was involved in the struggle against Turkey's constructions of the Edisu Dam on the Tigris River and is currently active in social movements in the region to advocate for water as a means for peace and cooperation. Nick will speak about international law concerning water and rivers and which options to exist to act against the use of water as a weapon. Nick, you have the floor. Well, I mean, first, first um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Medico International for organizing this uh, very, very timely and important conference. And, and a special thank you to Erjan for organizing this session, which I think is uh, of a critical issue. Um, I'm going to, ha I'm going to um, try and share my screen now to um, uh, have a, a presentation. Does that work? Yes. OK, well. Um, um, I mean, first of all, I'd, li I'd like to share some thoughts on, um, let me just see that this one goes, right, there we are. Um, <clears throat> share some thoughts on water as a vehicle for peace rather than violent conflict. Um, I think many, particularly policymakers, 
have spun a, a rather convenient myth that those who rely on shared waters, uh, shared sources of water, are somehow forever condemned to a perpetual state of, of violence um, or near violence in competition over that, that shared resource. In fact, historically, the reverse is true. Is true. Water has historically been a catalyst for peace rather than a cause for war, for collaboration rather than conflict. I mean, certainly there have been disputes over water. No one's denying that. But where conflict has erupted, including violent conflict, is very rarely because of an absolute scarcity of water. Instead, conflict tends to result from politically generated scarcities, rooted always in inequalities of power that enable one group to deny others access to water. Uh, this is the, this is the um, uh, Atta Dam. In the case of North and East Syria, the prime threat to water security, in my view, is not an absolute shortage of water, but the imperialist exploitation by successive Turkish regimes of Turkey's geographical position unilaterally to control the downstream flow of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And this hegemonic power has not come about by accident. It's a result of a deliberate policy. Under its um, ambitious Southeast Anatolia project, known as GAP, after its Turkish name, Turkey has been building huge storage dams on the Tigris and the Euphrates. As I mentioned, this is the Ataturk Dam on the Euphrates in Turkey. Now, together with two other major dams, Keban and uh, Karakaya, also on the Euphrates, uh, Ataturk provides Turkey with the capacity to store some 90 billion cubic meters of water. Now, just to give you an idea of how much water that is, it's a volume that exceeds the entire annual flow of both the Tigris and Euphrates put together. The entire annual flow. And Turkey has used this upstream control of Euphrates to block downstream flows on a number of occasions. Uh, in 1990, I mean, uh, uh, Egid has already given some, some examples, but just to give you a few more. In, in 1990, when it filled the Ataturk Dam, Turkey blocked all downstream flows to Syria and Iraq for nine full days. That means that no one was downstream was getting any water down the, uh, the Euphrates. In 2014, it, uh, to exert pressure on Syria, it again cut off flows, depriving millions of people around Aleppo of water. And here's a press clipping around that. Um, uh, it caused the late Lake Assad to drop six feet in, um, in, in depth. And it's this use of water as a weapon that has led the UK Defence Forum to describe Turkey's GAP project as, and I'm quoting here, one of the region's most dangerous water time bombs. Even if the flow of the Tigris and Euphrates is not entirely blocked by Turkey, the irrigation and other projects being developed under GAP have drastically reduced downstream flows to Syria and, to, and Iraq on a daily basis. And this is a, a diagram projecting the reduced share of the Euphrates going to Syria and Iraq as a result of dams and other developments upstream in Turkey. By 2040, just at the end of this diagram, Turkey will be taking more than half of the river's flows, the Euphrates flows. Um, 
leaving little for downstream states. And some warn that about a, one and a half million hectares of agricultural land in Iraq alone could fall victim to desertification, creating a widespread humanitarian crisis. And of course, along with the reduced flows, you also have declining water quality, as Egid mentioned, uh, due to the, uh, the runoff of agricultural chemicals and rising salt levels caused by poorly drained irrigation schemes in, in Turkey. And that's adding to the problem. Now, <clears throat> I suppose the question is, are Turkey's actions illegal? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes again. Its hegemonic control of the Tigris and Euphrates breaches not only international law, but also a number of bilateral agreements. The main international instrument governing the use of shared waterways, as Egid said, was, uh, is the UN Convention on the um, <clears throat> Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Watercourses. Now, Syria and Iraq are both signatories. Turkey is not. Turkey therefore denies that the convention applies to it. However, international lawyers dispute this. They argue that under international customary law, all states have an obligation to adhere to the main principles of the convention, if not the actual procedures that are, like, uh, are laid out in the convention, regardless of whether or not they're signatories. And this is also the view of the authoritative World Commission on Dams. This means that Turkey has an obligation to notify, to consult, and to negotiate. It must notify downstream states of its planned developments on its shared rivers. It must consult on those proposals, and it must negotiate on them with downstream states if those downstream states have objections. Uh, Turkey's relations with its downstream neighbors are also governed by a number of agreements and protocols made over, made over the years, some of them dating back for almost 100 years. I mean, so you have the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne, uh, which stipulates that there must be agreement on water projects in Turkey that affect downstream states and arbitration where no agreement can be reached. The 1930 protocol regarding um, borders, uh, and that's a protocol signed between France and Turkey, France at the time being uh, having the mandatory power over um, Syria. And that uh, requires that uh, disputes um, on the border um, be, be um, uh, resolved on the basis of equality and equity and through agreements. And then you've got the 1987 protocol between Turkey and Syria, under which Turkey guarantees that the Euphrates will maintain, quote, an annual flow of more than 500 cubic meters per second at the Syrian border, uh, Syrian-Turkish border. And then there are a number of agreements between Turkey and Iraq guaranteeing uh, minimum downstream flows uh, from the Tigris and Euphrates, and these obviously um, affect Syria because Syria is the middle Tur uh, country between Turkey and um, uh, Iraq. <clears throat> but critically, uh, none of these agreements, including the UN uh, Convention, apply or have any purchase for Rojava for Northeast Syria. Why? Because under international law, the only parties that can challenge through the courts where there's a, a dispute are states. And Northeast Syria is not a state. So any challenge would have to be by either Syria or Iraq. And we'll come to that later. Um, <clears throat> now, Turkey has systematically flouted these international and bilateral obligations. 
it's long rejected the notion that the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates constitute what, which is critical to all these agreements, a shared resource. And that view was forcefully put in 1992, years ago, by um, Suleyman Demirel, who was then Prime Minister of Turkey. And he said, you know, essentially, the quote is up there, but I mean, the, the key to it is he was saying that this is a matter of sovereignty and that Turkey has the right to do anything it likes with the water in Turkey. And the water resources in Turkey are Turkey's. No one else should have any say on, on their use. Now, since then, there have been some softening of the language, but Turkey has simply ignored the requirement to negotiate, to notify, and to consult. The no notification was given, for example, on Elisu, and there were no consultations with Syria and Iraq, despite both countries expressing concerns over the dam, and rightly so, because Elisu, in conjunction with the downstream dam at Jizre, which is now... Uh, on the cards we built, could actually completely halt the downstream flow of the Tigris, which of course flows through north and east Syria, uh, during dry periods. And that's critically imp important given climate change. As for maintaining minimum flows, under, as they're supposed to under these protocols, Turkey has breached its agreement where it suits it. So daily rates have dropped way before the agreed flows for days at a time. <clears throat> How has Turkey managed to get away with this? Well, one reason is that Turkey is a key NATO partner and its NATO allies who could exert uh, pressure on Turkey have been reluctant to do so for fear of alienating Turkey. And that is even more the case today after Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And the EU uh, could similarly exert pressure through its accession agreements with um, Turkey, but uh, it has simply buried its head in the sand um, and done zilch. Uh, the relative weakness of Turkey, of Iraq, particularly post the US-led invasion, uh, 20 years ago, and, and the relative weakness of Syria, given the current conflicts, have also allowed Turkey to get away with it, since any legal challenge to Turkey would have to be mounted by Turkey or Syria, neither of whom are prepared to take on Turkey in the courts. And it was very significant during the um, Elisu campaign that Iraq expressed its concerns over the dam via NGOs, letters to NGOs and documents that it provided to NGOs, not directly to any government. And it did that because it was simply too weak to really stand up and put its head over the parapet. And Russia is now a, a regional power and might have been able to act as a mediator, but following Putin's invasion of Ukraine, this is now unlikely and Turkey will again capitalize on this. And of course, Turkey and Russia are developing their own relationships. As for non-state actors, well, as I said, like uh, Northeast Syria, for example, or NGOs or community groups or whatever, they're just simply not in a position to challenge uh, Turkey through the courts, since state parties only have access to those courts. Now, what are the ways forward? And this is my last uh, slide. Um, does this mean that social movements in North and East Syria and elsewhere can do nothing at the international level to hold Turkey to account? Absolutely not. The UN system can and should be used uh, to expose Turkey and to seek address. And Egid and the Rights Defense Initiative and Shetim have already shown the way forward in this regard with their various complaints to um, UN human rights rapporteurs. And I think that this is a very important initiative. At alliances by social movements can and should be built with UN member states to press the UN Security Council uh, to act uh, against Turkey. 
the Security Council has discretion to investigate any dispute which might endanger peace. Now, obviously, uh, so, um, social movements do not have state status, but they can build alliances with member states on that Security uh, Council. They can publicize their concerns. They can use that as a forum to organize and also to expose Turkey's actions. Alliances can and should be built with social movements and parliamentarians in Iraq and in Syria to pressure uh, those governments to hold Turkey to account through the courts and to negotiate a trilateral agreement fit for the 21st century. Alliances can and should be made with social movements and parliamentarians in Europe, in the European Union, to make Turkey's accession agreements uh, to the European Union contingent on it upholding international customary law on shared rivers. And there's work to be done too at the regional level, in my view, in drafting a, a citizen's <coughs> trilateral um, water sharing agreement that reflects the demands of the grassroots rather than just governments and elites. And the water forums that have been organized by social movements in North and East Syria and in Iraq could be used as a basis for this work. I see it as an organizing tool, um, a way of, of exposing and discussing the issues, but also the way forward. And then once that, that draft treaty has been um, drafted, a tool that can be used in those other forums that I mentioned. I'll leave it there. Uh, and I look forward to discussing the issues raised. Um, uh, many, many thanks. And again, Erjan, thank you so much for organizing this. And Egid, thank you so much for your very, very good presentation, which was, it's tip top. So I'd love to hear more about what has happened to those complaints to the UN rapporteurs. Thank you also, Nick, for this great speech. We go a step further, and we are very happy that Katrin Henneberger joined our uh, panel uh, to introduce Katrin. She's a deputy in the German Federal Parliament for the Green Party since last year. Uh, before, she has been an activist of the climate justice movement especially in the organization Ende Gelände. She has been active also in the youth organization of her party. Uh, with the climate justice, she struggled for the defense of forests and villages in Western Germany against coal plants. She focuses on global climate justice and joins for several years the World Climate Conferences. In the parliament, she is a member of the two commissions economic cooperation and development, as well climate conservation and energy. Yes, uh, we are very happy and you have the floor, Katrin, please. Um, vielen, vielen Dank, vielen Dank, dass ich heute bei euch sein darf. Um, leider kann ich nicht vor Ort sein, weil ein lieber Freund slash Aktivist gerade uh, hier in Hamburg ein Moment, wegen Kat einer Katrin. Anti yeah. Ganz kurz. Is everything okay with the translation? Okay. Okay. Uh, continue. Uh, mach weiter. Entschuldigung. Yes, um, ja, ich kann leider nicht vor Ort sein, weil um, ein lieber Freund und Aktivist von mir wegen einer Aktion gegen Atom gerade hier um, eingesperrt seine Zeit verbringt und heute sozusagen die Möglichkeit war, ihn noch zu besuchen, während er noch im Gefängnis ist. Und das wollte ich auf jeden Fall machen. Und deswegen habe ich, bin ich jetzt digital zugeschaltet. Ähm, ich beschäftige bin heute hier auch, weil es mir sehr wichtig ist, sozusagen auch zu, zuzuhören und zu lernen und mitzunehmen an Informationen, ähm, als auch sozusagen Informationen über die aktuelle Lage vor Ort, ähm, um diese dann halt auch in, in meine Ausschüsse zu tragen, in unsere alltägliche Arbeit im Bundestag. Ähm, wie schon einführend gesagt worden ist, bin ich auch im 
Ausschuss für wirtschaftliche Zusammenarbeit und Entwicklung. Und da zuständig natürlich international ähm, für den Ausmaß der Klimakrise. Und global erleben wir in sehr vielen Regionen, dass auch aufgrund der Klimakrise ähm, Trinkwasser sich verknappt, ähm, es zu Dürren kommt und dass die Bevölkerung unter enormem Druck deshalb gerät. Und besonders halt in der Region Syrien, Irak, Türkei ähm, wird es in der Zukunft immer stärker zu Dürren kommen, aufgrund der Klimakrise. Ähm, also es ist eine Region, die in einer großen Wassergefahr ähm, sich befindet. Und im Angesicht sozusagen dieser, dieser Situation, also mit den Auswirkungen der Klimakrise, mit den Treibhausgasen, die jetzt schon in der Atmosphäre sind, ist es umso wichtiger, dass grenzübergreifend ähm, das Wasser fair geteilt wird und dass äh, grenzübergreifend ein gutes Management des Wassers, der Wasserflüsse, der Quellen, äh, aber auch des Grundwassers, der Seen ähm, bereitet wird. Aber Aktuell passiert ja das Gegenteil, beziehungsweise seit langem passiert schon das Gegenteil. Und die Türkei, ich habe es okay, wenn ich das so sage, setzt Wasser, der Zugang zum Wasser hier praktisch als, als Waffe ein, als Waffe gegen die Bevölkerung. Denn in dem Moment, wo man ähm, Wasser ähm, Teil der Bevölkerung auch halt in anderen Ländern untersagt, ähm, ist es halt, ein, eine, ja, ist es halt einfach ein direktes Verbrechen an den Menschen dort. Ähm, wenn das, der Zugang zu Trinkwasser Menschen verwehrt ist oder wenn es halt sehr viel weniger wird, dann hat das natürlich Ko Konsequenzen auf die Gesundheit. Es hat besondere Konsequenzen auch natürlich auf, auf Frauen, es hat auch Konsequenzen für Kinder. Ähm, und es, es macht halt die, die, die ganze Gesellschaft äh, macht unglaublich verwundbar. Und natürlich dann, als was als zweites hinzukommt, ist natürlich dann auch die Konsequenz, wir haben es eben gehört, ähm, dass 80 Prozent, also 80 Prozent der Lebensmittel aus lokaler Herstellung kommen. Ähm, also im ersten Vortrag wurde es einmal erwähnt, wenn es tun. Und das macht, das macht natürlich halt auch die Bevölkerung noch so verwundbarer, wenn das Wasser fehlt, um äh, landwirtschaftlich, landwirtschaftliche Produktion äh, zu gewährleisten, besonders in Jahren, wo eine große Dürre herrscht. Ähm, und deswegen ist, ist natürlich ist eine Selbstverständlichkeit auch von uns halt die Forderung, dass ähm, die Türkei den Zugang zu Wasser halt nicht als Waffe einsetzen darf, gegenüber der Bevölkerung generell nicht einsetzen darf. Und dass wir auch mit Blick auf die Klimakrise, mit Blick auf die Verschärfung, ähm, es internationale Lösungen geben muss, damit das Wasser ähm, für die Region ja, geteilt wird. Das war's. I mean, uh, in this panel, uh, I would say I heard more, uh, let's say, proposals and ideas than maybe I expected in the beginning. Um, so there's on the one way, um, if I could summarize, to raise the pressure on Turkey using, of course, UN, but political pressures at European international level. Um, by especially by civil society lawyers, but also by deputies which who are interested to work with us. That's the one way, and everybody of us is also requested to support such efforts. Uh, as water is a basic uh, element for life and each economic activity. I don't need to repeat this. The other point is to the issue of um, it's looking to programs, projects at the ground to adapt to climate change, which actually the people experience for 20 years. This is something which Nick especially highlighted, water harvesting and so on. But uh, this is something I would say is also important uh, or adapt the crops. But the critical issue is to work just this year, starting this year in a bigger campaign to, um, yes, to um, 
raise pressure on international level to criticize Turkey's approach uh, in a broader campaign, something like this we need. I mean, the situation is very crucial. One, two more years without waters, it would be much more uh, destructive for the millions of people, for what drinking, agriculture, energy, health. Yes, at this point, I close the panel. Thank you for listening. And we continue with the other discussions. Galax <laughs> Bus. Nick, Katrin, and Egit, thank you also so much for joining. Thank you. I try, thank to, you. try to summarize. We will stay in contact with three of you. Thank you. And yeah. we will start thank you. initiatives. Yes. Good. You will not give up. No. Yes. And no, this, we'll continue. this conference could be an initial point for us. We have more partners in civil society and Syria, Rojava, North Kurdistan, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and so on, and also in Europe. And each, we have the organizations and people to do. We must organize it. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Egid. Thank, thank, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Nick. Thank and you. thank you, Arjan. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.